Um, today, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Joe and Mary Purcell. Um, 15, 16 years ago, we met with Joe and Mary, and we were invited, I was invited by Dr. Joe to go to Nepal for my first trip, and I went, I said, okay, and I've been messed up ever since. <laughs> but the cool thing is, he invited me, so now everything that, any good that comes from this, he gets credit for in the kingdom of God. That's the cool part, right? He sowed a seed. I boiled his water so he could have a hot bath and everything, and I took good care of him. I was a good servant, and uh, then he left me and abandoned me, and I've been there all by myself ever since. But no, they're based in Singapore, and uh, they, he's been working as a leader, inspiring, growing, and uh, he's got his doctorate in Christology and helping people understand how to communicate the gospel centered around the name of Jesus. So it is an honor truly to have the Purcells here. So Dr. Joe, will you come and please bring the word today? Let's welcome them. Good morning. Good morning. A bucket bath in, in Nepal gives new meaning to a cold shower. That's mountain water. Lord, thank you for this time with the folks today. I pray for them and for all the people watching online. I ask you to give me utterance. And let the word of the Lord uh, that we need to hear come forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have been in ministry almost 35 years. We've been about 32 years of that time in Asia. And uh, we have lived in Arctic Russia, the Russian Far East. For the last approximately 20 years, we've been in Singapore, Southeast Asia. And uh, Pastor and I were talking, Pastor Lori, Mary, and Pastor Dennis and I were talking, and I was sharing with them that we have had a part in starting or directing 10 Bible schools from Arctic Russia to South India, um, eight of those um, schools that we directed were Rama campuses. We were asked to be the directors of Rama Singapore in about 2005 or so. And uh, out of that school, we began shifting. I began transitioning from teaching students to teaching teachers. And um, out of that effort, enough teachers came forth from that effort that we were able to start four campuses in Malaysia. The, the, the first and only campus in Russia, which, which later had to close, and then uh, helped with the establishment of two campuses in, in India. And at that point, uh, we, we had known that our assignment of managing and directing Bible schools was going to be temporary when we took on that job. We did it for, I don't know, can't remember, eight or nine years from 2005, 2006 till 2015, so that's nine years. And uh, the Lord led us to go back into more of pioneering missionary work. We, we had always worked cross boundaries, both geographical and denominational. Uh, but mostly on my heart were these young men and, and women, it's mostly men in Asia, young, young pastors uh, who are you know, not trained. Uh, ha over half the world's population is in Asia, about almost five billion people. And as great a job as Rama does in those places, the, the, the cold, hard truth is the vast majority of pastors will never be able to attend Rama. The vast majority of people will not be able to attend Rama because there's no school by them. Or they belong to a church or denomination that's got its own schools. And so they have to go to school there. And uh, that's one reason why I took the time to get the doctorate, that was, uh, that was a 10 year journey actually. Uh, and it was, uh, but it was a joy because the Lord led me to do it. I wouldn't recommend that to anyone unless God leads you to do it. But I wanted to be able to have the credentials where I could go into their schools. I mean, if they can't come to you, what are you gonna do? I, I'll, I'll go to them and we've always been graced to work with other groups outside our own people. I don't care. Uh, I'm not bound to, to you know, this idea, this is, this is my camp. I mean, I like the idea you need healing, you need somebody to pray with, then find a person who knows how to pray. 
But look, if they name the name of Jesus, they call on the name of Jesus, that's my brother or sister, and I'm open to them, and I want to help them. And not only that, I'll tell you the truth, I'm willing to learn from them. I've learned a lot from people uh, in other parts of the body of Christ. And so that was, that's what I felt led to do is to go, uh, now that we have teachers for those other Bible schools, and they're running just great, um, my heart was to go to the pastors that can't come to school and to go to tribal pastors. Some of these people in some of these countries are farmers. They may have only a primary school education. Some of them haven't even finished primary school. Some might have been to a high school, something like that. But, you know, Tony, Reverend Tony Cook's newsletter just came out, and he's, he had this statistic. Uh, there's about 2.2 million evangelical churches in the world, 85% are led by pastors with no formal theological training. So, but these people, um, you know, there's great books out there that you can learn from uh, in the Western world, but they don't have them because they're not in their language or they're complicated. I mean, some things are a little complicated and they're not going to be able to use that or, or, or work with that. And so my project in my doctoral uh, time was to develop a method of preaching Christ from all scripture that I could simplify for them. And so it could be translated into their languages. And so my material started to be translated into Bahasa, Thai, Burmese, uh, Vietnamese. And uh, next month I'm scheduled, Lord willing, to go to India. And that material will be translated into the language of that area of India, Telugu. And uh, some of it, I think, has been translated into Tamil. India's got a lot of languages. So uh, that's our focus. And I wanted to share with you this morning a little bit about why this emphasis on, on preaching Christ. Why do I do that? Well, uh, about 20 years ago or so, I noticed myself. Now, the pastor told you I was a lawyer. And one thing you learn as a lawyer is you've got to find out the weaknesses in your own case because if you don't, the, the other lawyer is going to find them, or the judge or the jury. So it's better that you look at your case very objectively. And that takes discipline. It takes, it's hard, it's, you, you know, you start to believe your own stuff because you live with it day and night. And um, so I started to do that with my own preaching. I had seen, uh, you know, Brother Hagen at Ramah. He took that approach of looking at what he was doing, and he lays motives before the Lord. Say, Lord, is there any area where I need to be corrected? The Apostle Paul, he said, up after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem to share with them the gospel that I'm preaching uh, out of concern that I had been running in vain. He wanted to submit his gospel to them. And so I began looking at my own preaching and teaching, and to be honest with you, I didn't see all my sermons in the New Testament. And uh, I thought, I don't sound like these fellas. And I prayed. I said, Lord, are my sermons like your sermons? Are, are my sermons like the apostle sermons? That was the start of a journey that, that has taken me up to this present time. And I saw things in the Bible where it said that... Uh, uh, Paul said, uh, we preach Christ and him crucified. And I thought, well, what does that mean? I, I don't know about you, but when I hear words like that, I stop and I start thinking about that. Well, what exactly does that mean? What do, what, does that mean you tell stories about Jesus? Does that mean you talk about his healing miracles? Well, that would be good. It's, it's necessary to hear about the healings in the Gospels. It's necessary to know the story of Jesus. But is that what Paul meant? I wanted to know why. Why this emphasis on Christ and him crucified? Paul said that my gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and raised the third day. And when I read that, honestly, I thought, how could you preach that for 40 minutes? How could you preach that for 52 weeks of the year? He told the Corinthians, he said, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was smart enough at least to think that, you know, probably the Apostle Paul has more insight here than I did. And uh, his insight was profound into that. And as I began to look at it, you know, that'll eventually, you get to the road to Emmaus. You remember, remember that story when after Jesus rose from the dead, he was, uh, there were two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. That's a distance of what, about seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. 
Jesus appeared to them in a form that they did not recognize, and, uh, and he asked them questions. Jesus likes to ask questions, and he said, what, you know, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you know, don't you know? I'm paraphrasing. He said, don't you know? You're the only visitor to Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened? He said, what things? Isn't that interesting that Jesus would kind of lead you down the road that way? What things? They said, well, the Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet mighty in, in word and deed. We thought he was going to be the one to restore Israel, but, you know, he was crucified, and, and now we're mystified because some of, the, some of the sisters in our group say they went to the tomb and he's not there. And, you know, we don't, they were downcast. They were discouraged. And um, I, I want to read to you what Jesus said there. He said, uh, O foolish ones, he said, oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And that caught my attention, because I thought, wait a minute, what do you mean, all that the prophets have spoken? And then he, he tells us, what did, what did they talk about? He's going to summarize the entire Old Testament. And some t- people have this confused. They think that the gospel's just in the New Testament, and the law's just in the Old Testament. They confuse the testament with the covenant. But the glory of the new covenant was concealed in the Old Testament. But Jesus and the apostles, they preached the gospel exclusively from Old Testament scriptures. And amazingly, they preached Jesus risen from the dead. And here he says, well, the prophet said, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, And with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. I mean, this caught my attention, especially as a lawyer. I'm thinking, what do these words mean? Later, he appears to the other disciples in Jerusalem, and he says to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets are the three main divisions of the Hebrew Bible. That's the Bible that Jesus would have been using, the Jewish Bible. Their Old Testament, all the books of the Old Testament are organized under the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. So what Jesus is saying, all things written about me in the entire Old Testament uh, must be fulfilled. He, then he says, thus it is written. He's going to summarize the whole Old Testament. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. I mean, that's astounding to me. I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't seen that, that Throughout the Old Testament, through all the prophets, through all the law, God is one way or another proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus died, he was buried, he was raised from the dead. And I thought, you know, as I began to study this more and more, I I, I saw from Paul's presentation of the gospel, you know, Paul wrote the book of Romans he did not start that church. And the, the people there didn't really know him. So when he wrote the book of Romans, he was he's really sharing the way he preaches with them. And the fascinating thing about the book of Romans is the first three chapters, well, you know, it's, it's written to Christians. It's not written to the heathen. I mean, you know, it's addressed to the saints that are at Rome. But for the first three chapters of that letter, Paul is preaching the law. Now, remember that in Romans 8, 1, the most beloved verse in the Bible for most of us, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what he wrote in the first three chapters, he did not write to give them a sin consciousness. But in those first three chapters, he, he gets up to verse 16, and he talks then, he gives me the answer I'm looking for. What, what does this mean, preaching Christ? What does that mean, preach Christ and him crucified? You just say that over and over for, for 35, 40 minutes on Sunday? How, how do you do that? Paul said, the gospel is the power of God. 
to all those who believe. Verse 17, he says, because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. This is not the righteousness that God demands of you. This is the righteousness that God imputes to you, to those who have faith in the Lord Jesus. And then immediately on the heels of that verse, that's verse 17, immediately, you have to read these things together. He says, okay, verse 17, he says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation because it reveals the righteousness of God. Verse 18, because the wrath of God against the unrighteousness, against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men has been revealed from heaven. So there is this dual revelation. Now, we don't often talk about the law, and I want to say right up front, we're not, if you're a Christian, if you've been uh, born again, if you're justified by faith, you, you are not under the law. We don't keep the law to be righteous. The law really does three things. Number one, it's intended to keep order in society. And one of the signs of end times is lawlessness. Deception and lawlessness are the two key indicators of end time. That's one function of the law. The other function of the law is that it describes God. It describes God in his perfection. I'm telling you, I, I wish you could read it like a lawyer. You, you read the law. That's the part of the Bible that a lot of people don't get into. Honestly, I didn't read it a lot before. But you look at the minute, excruciating detail that's required uh, for holiness, for the vessels and the temple and the tabernacle and the priests to be holy. It's precise, excruciating, minute detail. And so and the law shows us the magnificent glory and beauty and purity and holiness of God. One reason people have a light estimation of sin is because they have a very low estimation or, and really complete ignorance of holiness and the glory of God. When we, when we lived in Russia, in Arctic Russia, the water would come out of the tap black for the first few hours. Uh, and then it would turn to a bright orange. And if you showered in that water, you'd turn orange, you know. So uh, we had four small children. Uh, it was muddy, especially in the Arctic when spring comes around, break up, mud, mud everywhere. My wife was hours, hours, hours every day using this dilapidated little Russian machine to, to wash clothes for, for all of us. Uh, she had to you know, help move the agitator with a stick. The water had to be filtered through uh, cotton. American cotton wouldn't filter it. We had to use Russian cotton, and it was a job. But, we, you know, she did such a good job. We looked nice. Our clothes were clean. Our clothes were pressed, and so on and so forth. We, we, we thought everything is great, but when we would come back to the States to get a visa, suddenly, in the brightness of all the colors and all the wonderful things that America has is, we saw how shabby we looked. The reason people have a low estimation of sin is because they've never been to the throne of God. They have never stood in the presence of ineffable glory. And people say, well, you know, that's not really fair of God. You have no idea. We have no right to assess God. You know, that's not our job. So... Things that we think are, well, those are just little sins. In the presence of the glory of God in which there is not even a scintilla of sin. You know, the wonderful thing about heaven is uh, we'll not only be sinless, we'll be unable to sin. Not only unable to sin, but unable to be tempted. There's no sin there. It's pure and perfect love and, 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 and holiness. So... What Paul is doing then in those first three chapters of the book of Romans, he launches out. He says, that God has revealed his righteousness through the gospel because the wrath of God, see, that didn't go away. That's still there. In fact, the wrath of God abides on those that do not trust in Jesus. The wrath of God is already abiding on 
people that do not trust in Jesus to take away their sins. And by the same token, those who have believed, the sentence has been passed. You're not waiting for the last day to know your status with God. You've been judged, and you've been judged righteous. You have been judged. Your sins are blotted out. They are forgiven. You're justified, washed in the blood of Jesus. To be justified is to be declared righteous. It's the same word in the, in the Greek New Testament. Righteousness and justification, same thing. To be declared absolutely everything you've ever thought, said, done, wrong, or omitted to do has been blotted out because the Son of God came to this earth, became man, and when he went to the cross, wrapped himself in our sin, he was made to be sin, and when he did that, the law had to curse him. Because the law is holy, righteous, and good. The law had to condemn him. And the wrath of God, the unmitigated wrath of God, was poured out upon him on the cross. So the cross is a, at one and the same time a revelation of the righteousness of God and of the wrath of God. That was my cross. That it was your cross. And this is what Paul is doing. He's convincing them, both Jew and Gentile, all under sin. I don't have time to read it, but if you read chapter 3, verses 10 through 20, you will see this litany of there is none righteous, not one, no one does good, no one, nothing, not at all. Not, you know, I, I remember reading that one day. I, I grew up in church, and, and uh, this is a stupid uh, idiotic, but I thought I was a nice sinner. <laughs> I, I didn't think God had to save me as much as he had to save, you know, everybody else. Maybe just 30%. <laughs> I, I'd like to tell you I'm kidding, but I was, you know, I would never have said that, but it, it was running in the background. I thought, well, I'm a nice sinner. And a lot of people think they're nice sinners. They don't realize that Look, how bad was it if the Son of God had to come and die on a cross in your place? Well, you know, I haven't done that much bad. I've just done this, this, this. You, you have no idea. And so what Paul does, he puts us under the microscope. I know what he's doing. He's like a prosecutor. He's going for a conviction, and he gets it. He says the law closes every mouth. It shuts every mouth so that people will realize the only way for you, the only possibility for you is for someone greater than you, perfect, sinless, holy, to take your place so that when that wrath was poured out on Jesus, have you ever seen a video on YouTube of what it's like inside one of those vehicles re-entering the Earth's atmosphere? That thing is engulfed. In fire. I think the temperature is 27,000 degrees. I can't remember. It's traveling fast. It might be, it's traveling 27,000 miles per hour. I don't know. The temperature is super hot. And I think of that when I think about the unmitigated wrath of God poured out on Jesus like fire. And I remember when I was reading Romans 3 one day and I, I suddenly dawned on me, I thought he was talking about all of you guys. I didn't think he was talking about me. <laughs> I mean, he starts out with the heathen and they're into all kinds of immorality and perversion. And then he turns on the Jews. You know, my paraphrase, you guys think you're great stuff because you've got the law. Well, let me tell you. And those of you that are judging these other people, you do the same things. That takes a lot of fun out of judging people, by the way. <laughs> more and more, I find when I, somebody does something or this, this, I get, ah, this you know, we like to think it's righteous indignation. It's really self-righteous indignation. And over and over, I'm caught. And the Holy Spirit shows me, you did the same thing. You've done that. You've said that. You've thought that. You can't, you can't go around judging people then, or you judge yourself. That's what Paul said. So when I got to chapter 3, verses 10, 10 through 20, I'm reading this, and the light comes on. Suddenly, I realize, Wait a minute, he's talking about me. 
I don't know if you remember the first Star Wars movie where Luke finds out that Darth Vader is his father. Do you remember Luke's reaction? He's like, no! (laughs) And that's how I felt like, no, impossible. But that's what the Word of God says, and that's why it has to be a revelation, because people always think, we always think we're better than we are. We've never been to the throne room of heaven, so we think we're pretty good people, yeah? And by the same token, if you talk to people, Christians, who, who have ever heard about the gift of righteousness, I can tell you as a teacher, a lot of time their eyes glaze over because it takes a revelation. Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, when they heard what Jesus talked about redemption, they said, our hearts were burning within us. A great man of God said this. He said, the ultimate test of your spirituality is the measure of your amazement at the grace of God. In other words, if you're saved and you're not amazed that you're saved, you don't know yourself very well. If we hear about redemption and our hearts do do not burn within us, then I'm not saying we're not saved, but I am saying redemption has not grabbed us as it could. Because when someone dies for you, someone lays down their life for you, who's perfect. Jesus is the only person who lived a perfect life, totally deserved to be rewarded, and he got what he did not deserve. That was my place. That was your place. That's the place of every human being on this earth. This was set in motion in in the garden when Satan tempted Adam and Eve and said, you know, if you disobey God, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, and then you'll know what's right and wrong. Does that sound familiar? People, everybody wants to be their own God. They want to make the rules. They want to decide what's right and wrong. That still infects the whole human race, and even for Christians, that gets into our minds. We're not God. And the, 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 the third purpose of the law is to show you you're not God. It brings order to society. It shows us the perfection of God. It shows us what God's like. And then the third purpose of it is to show you you are not like that. And some people are afraid of the law. But once you're justified and you know you're not condemned, during life, even if you don't open up to the Ten Commandments, you're going to bump into the law as a believer. If you love Jesus and you're serving him, you're going to bump into things in your personality that are not the love of God. Your flesh didn't, didn't disappear. You can't just say, well, that, that wasn't me. You know, brother, you, you, know, you shouldn't talk to your wife that way. Oh, well, that wasn't me. That's, that's not the real me, you see. I'm a new creation. That's not me. Well, who, who was it? Oh, that's, that's my flesh. Really. Try that with the state patrol. Sir, did you know you're doing, you're doing 90 in a, in a 60? Well, officer, that, that's not really me. It, it wasn't? It looked like you? No? Uh, th- that was my flesh. Listen, the thing is, it's your flesh. It's not my flesh. I've got enough problems with my own flesh. That's your flesh. And that flesh looks like, talks like, walks like the old man. And in this in-between time between the resurrection of Christ and the coming of Christ or our transitioning to heaven, we still deal with that. And the law will highlight it, but it highlights it to show you this is what you cannot do. You cannot save yourself. You cannot sanctify yourself. You can place yourself under the Word of God and the Spirit of God And God will work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. I want the the young pastors in Asia to know how to preach Christ. So that's why I go to them. I, I want to teach them how to read the Bible deeply, not skim it, not superficially. I want redemption to grab a hold of them. 
You know what I mean? I, I labor at that on myself every day to appropriate that more and more. You don't have to have a deep intellectual understanding of God to be saved. You just have to cry out, Lord Jesus, save me. If you have a habit or an addiction, listen, you cannot break that thing. If you could, Jesus would not have had to die for you. I've heard so many testimonies going back to when I was a student at Rhema, people that, you know, just take, take smoking, for example, where they, they wanted, they were sincere, they wanted to overcome that. They struggled and struggled. Uh, I remember one testimony, I think it was Brother Hagen shared it, where this man said, Lord, I can't, I can't do this. But even as he was smoking, he began to thank God and to praise him. Lord, I thank you for your, for your blood. I thank you. I'm forgiven. That's why justification is the power of the gospel. Justification is the hinge on which the whole Bible turns. It is the article on which the church stands or falls. Without justification, there's no Christianity. Without justification, there's no Christians. Without justification, you have no standing before God. Without justification, you have no right to believe anything from God because justification is what washes you, cleanses you, blots out the past, qualifies you to be a partaker of God's inheritance in the saints. It gives you a voice before God because someone went before you, stood in your place, bore the wrath of God, and, and not only did that, but he fulfilled the law. And he took all the habits, the addictions, took those addictions to himself. You know, when, when, when a person has an addiction, it torments them. Jesus took that torment. That's, that's why he cried out, my God, my God. You read in the Psalms, and, and like what someone said in the Psalms in the Old Testament, you read the words of Jesus not recorded in the Gospels. And there's one place in one psalm as, a, as the intercessor who's numbered with the transgressors. The, the psalmist is, is speaking, uttering the words of Jesus where he says, Oh God, my iniquities have gone over my head. He's wrapped up in them. If you could have broken it, you'd done it a long time ago. Justification is what severs Satan's ability to dominate you because you're forgiven. If you believe in Jesus, you're forgiven. You're forgiven before all your problems are resolved. And when you, you receive that, my friends, it brings liberty. Our hearts burn within us because of this redemption. Forgiven. Forgiven. In the name of Jesus. Pray with me, Heavenly Father. Let me, let me just ask if there's anyone here today you, with an uplifted hand and those that are watching online with an uplifted hand, you'd say, I want Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to be set free. I, you know, I want to be set free of my sins. Is there anyone like that here in this, this room? If you're watching online or even here, I want you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you. Say this with me, Lord Jesus. You died for me. You were buried with my sins, my addictions, my problems, my bondage. And you were raised from the dead because I've been justified. I am forgiven now in the mighty name of Jesus. I say now to you, be free in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.